Freddie. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Michael Ketter. Uh, I'm currently uh, president of the Belinda Creek Catherine Coordinating Committee, which I've been for two decades now. Uh, so you get that from murder, but there you have it. Still enjoy the role, still very passionate about what we do. I'd like to thank Brisbane City Council for inviting me here today uh, to have a bit of a chat with you about linkages, and I've been asked to go broad. I could go really broad and talk about galactic linkages, but I won't. I'll zoom down and start with the oceans. But before that, I just want to talk a little bit about the Limba Creek Catchment Coordinating Committee, because it's one of my favourite organisations, obviously, I've been involved with it for 20 years. And we were established in 1997 with a very simple mission to build a web of green across the Limba Creek and our surrounding catchments. And to do that, we had to build a web of people across those catchments as well. We've been very successful in doing that. We've set up innumerable bush care groups, supported innumerable other groups, supported community campaigns, and uh, done a whole pile of projects. Last year we worked on 182 separate sites in and around Belinda Creek and the Greater Brisbane region. Uh, we've created over 350 hectares of habitat. We've helped through campaigning protect another 460 hectares of habitat, which in the urban, in urban context is a tremendous amount of habitat. We've put in, collectively, between us and all our volunteers, we've put in over 300,000 hours of volunteer effort on the ground. And we're well over half a million plants, probably close to three quarters of a million plants now. I don't know whether Stefan's got the numbers at the top of his head, but uh, we seem to propagate and plant a vast number of plants every year. We started out with a very small grant from the Natural Heritage Trust. Anyone who remembers the Natural Heritage Trust will remember that's the money we got for selling Telstra. Everyone said it was a waste of money. Well, I can assure you it wasn't a waste of money. It invested in groups like the B4C. From that small grant of $30,000 for three years, we were able to build a very powerful community-based social enterprise so that now 90% of our income comes from our commercial activities of restoring natural areas. We had a sales of $970,000 last year. Now, that takes a lot of work, but we're also doing it for a purpose. It's not just out there to make a pile of money. It's out there to restore the natural environment of Glimber Creek and the Greater Brisbane region. So to that end, we use some of our surplus funds to fund our wider activities. And one of those activities we've helped fund through putting the time of our catchment coordinator, catchment manager, sorry, uh, Wayne Cameron, is into a thing called the Brisbane Catchments Network for the past three or four years. And we've, we've, we've bankrolled a lot of that process because we believe that environmental organising and rebuilding nature is about addition, not subtraction. So we're about adding more people. We're about adding more landscape. We're about adding more connections, more power to the community to affect on-ground change. So we invest in things like the Brisbane Captions Network. We've also decided last year as part of our social um, dividend, as it were, to, to play a role on the bigger regional scale and look at some of the key things we could implement out of the South East Queensland Natural Resource Management Plan, which is the overarching plan done by the regional land care group to guide the restoration and rehabilitation of the landscapes of South East Queensland, agricultural, natural and human landscapes. So to that end, we purchased 120 hectares of land near the Mount Barney National Park, completely for no financial gain whatsoever. It was simply to link a disconnected piece of the National Park to the World Heritage Area. So that was our commitment and part of the social dividend from our social enterprise to link national parks to world heritage, to link community effort to protect the boundaries of these world heritage areas. We've also done a number of large signature projects in Belinda Creek which we've been involved with for a long time and they've been quite successful. One of them is the Oxbow project in the lower Belinda Creek. The Oxbow is a cut off branch of the river. Um, it was very badly degraded when we got involved. We got involved uh, because Port Motorway was going to be put through the area and at that stage they were preparing to preload that means put a whole pile of fill on the floodplain and put a four-lane highway on top of it, which would of course create a huge dam in the lower Belinda Creek. The community was understandably very upset by this. The main roads engineers were very adamant that they had a plan and they were going to implement it. So the groups linked together to form a group and then they linked with us and brought us in to negotiate, in inverted commas, uh, with main roads to see if we could get a better environmental outcome. 
Now, negotiating with main roads engineers who have got a fixed idea in their mind is fairly difficult. We relied on the good graces of our then local state member, Pat Purcell. I think at one point in time, mum about lumps of 4 be 2 to them, uh, as Pat does in his own uh, colourful way. And uh, he managed to convince them to give us a hearing, and we put together a rehabilitation plan for the Oxbow and an alternate building plan for the freeway so that they could build their freeway, we could restore ecological function, we could protect floodplain functions, we could cope with sea level rise and do all these other things together. So after 20 rounds of banging our heads against concrete and working with three-dimensional modelling and LIDAR, we came up with a floodplain recovery plan where the port motorway was raised off the ground. It wasn't built on an embankment anymore. It was raised about yay high off the ground to cope for fauna. And they said, what fauna? And we said, there's no fauna here yet, but there will be. Um, so, and then all the water from that was taken away and put through biological filtration and polishing ponds and through groundwater filtration to restore a wetland that was salinating because it wasn't getting proper flushing. And there was a whole pile of salt marsh that had been chopped to mud by four-wheel drivers and people dumping car wrecks and you, you have yahooing around down there. So what we decided is that we could restore that salt marsh and to do that we could use the machinery that was being used to build the roads when it wasn't busy doing anything else. So we leveraged a lot of heavy machinery, spare concrete and things, to re-engineer the Oxbow wetlands. It's the largest coastal restoration project in Queensland and it's probably one of the most successful. We've been able to restore dead, dead mangroves to living mangroves, bare mud to healthy salt marsh, to such an extent we've now got 37 species of fish breeding in the Oxbow. When we started there were just puffer fish. That's all there was, blue-green algae and purple and yellow water from the toxic waste that had been dumped there. So by building the road we were able to restore contaminated land, we were able to rebuild the mangroves, rebuild the salt marsh and lock up this area and protect it for nature conservation purposes. The bottom line of this was that the Port Motorway finished under time and under budget. It was the first large-scale engineering project in Queensland to use biological filtration and control road runoff, and as such they won several international awards for their engineering. This is the power of linkages. If those groups hadn't said, oh, give me for c and they know what they're doing, if Pat Purcell hadn't gone, I believe what these people are saying, and we hadn't done the hard yards with the engineers and linked with those engineers and got them to understand what we're talking about in terms of floodplain processing, we would have just had a dam on Bolivar Creek. We would have still had contaminated land, we would have still had dead mangroves and we would have had no salt marsh restoration. So that's one of the powers of linkages. <coughs> Another site I want to talk about that we did was the Tingalpa wetland site. When I first got involved with the Tingalpa wetland site, Divine Homes, who I sometimes call satanic, um, <coughs> were building a development at Tingalpa and they had the bulldozers ready to go to bulldoze this wetland ecosystem. Some local people who had been farmers there approached me and said, look, we know this wetland is really important because we know it never dries out. That's the first 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so again, B4C got involved and we came up with an alternate plan where they could not bulldoze the wetlands, they could uh, give the developer slightly increased development rights in another area so that they wouldn't fill the wetland ecosystem in. And the B4C agreed that we would maintain that site. So, with the help of the Lord Mayor and the Lord Mayor's Environment Advisor, that was Jim Sawley at the time, we stopped the bulldozers and we started to restore the Tingalpa wetlands. And what we found out was the groundwater link system. It was linked to streams, so it never dries out. Even in the driest time, it never dries out. So, through our restoration efforts there and egg sealing and restoring that habitat, We've been able to have plants come back that haven't seen, been seen in Brisbane for a century. So a native mint and a native ribbon plant that haven't been seen in a century. Once we cleared all the hyacinths and weeds out, they came back there. We also got it up from about 35 species of birds to 110 species of birds utilising the site. So again, the power of linkages. And to help us do that, we door knocked that entire suburb and said, this is your bushland area. And we talked to all the kids who went there and said, this is the place you can make your cubbies. This is your park. And got everyone involved with it. Even got a local rugby identity to go around and talk to them. And to such an extent that we have very little vandalism there. So 
So another example of building linkages and restoring habitat to with people and with a smart application of policy and on-ground rehabilitation techniques. On the regional front, I've been able to do the same thing with, through my involvement with the Natural Heritage Trust, where I was the chair of the regional assessment panel there for about four or five years and chair of the regional strategy group. We've been able to set up a network of catchment groups across South East Queensland to do the same thing because it's the restoring the habitat that gets us up in the morning. Now, take home message from all this. How long did it take to get the habitat and the landscape to the state that it is in now? It took over 100 years to get it to where we are now. So to get it back, how long do you think it's going to take? It's going to take at least 100 years, if not longer. Rehabilitation of landscapes is not a process where you plant a tree and you walk away. It's a long-term commitment. And we've hosted a number of Chinese delegations to look at our work, and they have a saying over there that to plant a tree is like having a child. It's the same level of commitment. Now, I don't know how much fun you've had getting new kids out of home, but I can tell you they take a while. So the same goes for trees. If you plant a tree, you're not just going to plant it, water it, fertilise it and walk away. You've got to manage that trajectory all the way until that's a mature tree until we've restored it to a multi-layer, multi-purpose landscape. It's a long-term commitment. It's not a job we're going to see finished. It's not a job our children are going to see finished or their children. But we've got to set the seeds for that. And that's what we try to do with NHD and those sorts of projects is we try to build the community capacity and to build the community learning. So to do that, I want to just talk about the three dimensions of lands, linkages. That's links of people to people, people to nature, and nature to nature. But first of all, I just want to go into a bit of definitions. Now, in the 1930s, there was a lot of debate about whether groups of plants and animals behave like an organism. People were beginning to realise in the 30s that our natural landscapes are very complicated. They're not just made of the individual animals and plants. They actually all work together. And that's the whole basis of ecology. Ecology is the study of influence and change, or how things are linked together. Now, it's not just living things, it's non-living things. And in 1930, a guy called Tansley wrote this very cute paper called The Use and Abuse of Vegetational Terms which was a big debate between them and <coughs> successional theorists, and he coined this phrase, ecosystem. That's where the notion of the ecosystem came from, that they were, these assemblages were quasi-organisms. They weren't alive, like a normal thing, but they were so complicated they were in a system together and it's all the living and non-living things together, linked together. So when we're doing restoration of habitat, it's not just things, it's processes. So if you look at what we did at the Oxbow, we looked at the processes, how the floodplain works, how it works in dry times, how it works at spring tides, how it works at low tides. So habitat is not a noun, it's a verb. It's a thing that's alive. You can think about it as it's all alive and it's processes as well as things. So it's where the air comes from, it's where the water comes from, it's the linkages. Now some of these linkages are not obvious. I'll just give one example before I start getting into the people and people stuff. Why do we have it? There's a thing in South East Queensland called the McPherson Maclay Overlap. Probably never heard of it. It's a uh, biological term that recognises from the Maclay River up to here we have an overlap of temperate and subtropical species. Barrington Tops down in New South Wales is the southernmost limit of subtropical rainforests. The border ranges are the northernmost limit of the Gondwanan forests and the Antarctic beaches. What's the thing that links it together? Well, as it turns out, it's an ocean current that links it together. There's a central eastern current that goes as far down as the Manning River and then it turns around and comes back up and goes as far up as Fraser Island. Now, that current marks that whole McPherson Maclay overlap. It has helped drive the entire vegetation and animal community of that whole zone. It separates us from the Great Barrier Reef and it separates us from the different southern oceans. So there's some of the subtle linkages that you've got to look for when you're doing habitat restoration. So now to the meat of what we're on today, I've been brought enough, hopefully, <laughs> is linking people. So ultimately what the P4C was on about was the notion that together we could do more than we could do alone. That together we were stronger, and that's not a bad for Hillary Clinton, 
Um, together we could do more things, we could achieve more things. So to do that, you've got to link people together. Now, if you want to find the common ground between people, sometimes it's worth looking right between your feet and then looking up at them again. And there it is. That's literally the common ground. The land we share together. The landscape we're walking in. That's how we link people together. And the whole notion of bush care is to put that linking together, that we can work together on a common project. And it's and it came from a very simple analysis. Way back when, when the uh, Australian Literal Society existed, before it became the Marine Conservation Society, they, worked, they wanted to know how to connect people to environmental issues in their local area. And they, they found a study that said gardening is the leisure time activity of 70% of people. So they said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we got native plants into gardening? At that time, nurseries weren't selling native plants in Brisbane. This is the early 70s. It was a fairly rare thing. Few people were into native gardening, but not many. So they came up with this notion of the big garden. That the landscape was the big garden, and that by restoring it and planting native trees, we could carry out this common gardening activity together, which was something people were very interested in. So that's one way to link people together. You find that common interest. Is it birds? Is it orchids? Is it fungi? Is it gliders? Whatever it is, find that common thread and work on it together to find a common area of interest where you can do something. Now, BCC supports our efforts doing that through in-kind grants and technical support, and that was a visionary council to do that. And that's another important linkage to the people. How do you link community effort to government? Because ultimately, Governments control a lot of what we do in the so-called public sphere and public land. If Jim Sawley and Sally Ann Atkinson before him hadn't thought that getting people involved in repairing the landscape was a good idea, it would have gone on as guerrilla planting. Because when I was growing up in the 70s, I know someone here said they set up a bush care group in the 70s. Well, when I was doing planting in the 70s, we'd sneak, sneak into the edges of parks and plant things. <laughs> go, oh, good, I wonder how that tree got there. Um, but these days, it's a lot more organised, and that's because we've been able to link community aspirations to government programs. So what I like to think about is linkages go bottom up and top down. That's the way things work best. Not as governments tell us what to do, not for the public are bashing their heads against the government, but if there's an empowerment where community aspirations can come up and meld with government programs and, and policies so that we get a multiplication of effort, an addition of effort, not a subtraction of effort. That's my 20 minute call. So, linking people to people, linking people to policy, and the boring old topic, which I know the uh, hackers will be involved in, linking people to planning, getting people to understand planning fundamentally affects how our environment goes. And then there's the rural linkages. Once you get out in the rural landscape, it's not so much the big garden, it's the big paddock, and uh, you've got to find the common grounds there, which are weeds and salinity and things like that. And again, build people together, form land care groups, work towards common actions on the ground and get funding to do it. The problem we've got in the wider rural context is government policy blows hot and cold. So we've got a 100 year project to do, and every three years the government's policies change. Last budget we had $460 million cut out of land care. That has put a big jammy in getting on-ground restoration in rural areas. So we've got to go back to the drawing boards, rebuild public understanding of why we need to do it, rebuild community effort to lobby our politicians to restore that funding, and then to get back on with the job because it's a long-term project. So linking people to nature is part of it. And when I started doing this work, I like to think a lot of people lived in a green and grey blur. People would walk along and they probably wouldn't know what they were looking at. Most people wouldn't have known what trees they were looking at. Back when I started working in catchments, the creeks were called drains, and they had no names. And you'd walk along and say, oh, look at that drain there, that's horrible. And there was a lot of effort to cover in drains and fill drains and get rid of drains, but we now know these are the vital veins of the ecosystem which we need to link our landscapes and ecological processes together. So one of the first things we did when I was setting up the Norman Creek Catchment Coordinating Committee 21 years ago was give creeks names. We went to a guy called Bill Kitson, 
at the uh, Museum of Mapping and Surveying at the Land Centre there. We looked at the 1890 survey maps and the 1910 survey maps and we found the old creeks and we found the old billabongs. And we got the council, again, yeah, that vital linkage up to the council to say, you need, if you want people to value these things, you've got to put a name on them. So you might have driven around Brisbane and you've seen these signs. You are now entering Norman Creek Taxman's. You are now entering Belinda Creek Taxman's. That was part of our cunning plan to make people aware. Because when you're driving in your car, you really don't notice that these ups and downs are actually marking catchment boundaries. As a push bike rider, I was well aware, uh, having boiled my way up the slopes and down again. Um, so we got people to name them. We put names on the creek. So now when you cross the creek, it says Bolimba Creek. It says Norman Creek. It says Cabbage Street Creek. It says Mogul Creek. So we put names on it because names give value to things, to people. This is how we fight the green and grey blur. We empower people with knowledge. If you give people the knowledge of what's going on, they're more likely to talk about it to their friends and family and say, well, you know that tree there. Well, that's actually a eucalyptus, da 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 And it's the habitat of the following animals. So it gives people social currency, but it also brings around this sense of place. And our theory is that a sense of place leads to a sense of identity, a sense of ownership, and a higher likelihood of action. It's no longer just the drain down the road. It's my local creek. It's no longer just a bit of bush over there. That's a such and such forest, and that's the important home of the squirrel glider. It gives value to those landscapes. It gives people pleasure and a sense of identity to know these things about their landscape and to feel like they're a person in the landscape rather than just a guest or a stranger wandering around going, what is this place? So, okay, so that's... People to nature, it's a very important link, and it never stops. We all like learning. I, I like to go to workshops and find out more. I can never remember all the plants. I always take botanists with me when I go. I'm more a systems guy, and I, I like to learn more about insects and plants. So that's all about this discovery of those linkages. Okay, so now, how am I going for time there? I'm going good? Good. Okay, now let's get to the business of what we're doing here today, which is... Um, Restoring habitats, corridors and linkages. I took a while to get there. Um, this is about the nature, the nature stuff. This is you know, more garden variety. Let's get out there and link things. Now, to my mind, it's all about permeability. And no, that's not something you put in milk. Okay? <laughs> permeability is the porosity. How, how, um, how things can move through the landscape. Where there are barriers to things in the landscape, whether there are fish barriers, whether there are barriers to people accessing nature, barriers between bits of nature and other nature, hard surfaces, dangerous surfaces like roads. So what we're on about in terms of restoration of things and processes is this whole notion of permeability. We're trying to make the landscape permeable to ecological processes, to things, to people, and to our interaction with those places. So it's not just a question of linking things together one after one like a road network, although connectivity is very important, but connectivity is more than just being physically connected. It's having a linkage of some sort. Now, some animals can cross gaps. Some animals, like wallabies and brewers, actually prefer the open paddocks. So to create a linkage between grassland ecosystems and woodlands, you don't want continuous woodlands. For fire management purposes, you actually want to break it up. So the permeability has got to be honed into the requirements of that particular landscape and what feature you're looking at. For floodplains, we want to have floodplains open and ready to go. And floodplains are important for restoring our habitats because animals and plants are very bad at using taps for some reason. And they need to get their water from somewhere. And how do they get their water? It's mostly from groundwater. Where do forests get their water from when it's not raining? That's in the soil. So you need to make the landscape literally permeable to water so enough water can be captured in the soil and underground to be able to sustain these forest areas through times of drought and to have those ecological functions and to make the base flow of our stream so it's flowing all the time and not just flash flooding when it rains carrying a whole pile of pollutants. So the permeability of water, permeability of birds, permeability of gliders, permeability of pollinators and all sorts of things through the landscape is what we're trying to do. So we're trying to set up networks. Corridors have come back to bite us. We've talked about corridors, but the politicians have a funny point of view of corridors. You build a corridor and they say, 
Where's the Ford using it? Where's the koala waiting for a 666 <laughs> bus to oblivion? Now, it hasn't got a go back. Can it go up and down there every day? Well, some corridors work like that, but some linkages are broader. Some are spores and pollens, uh, plants, um, birds flying through, animals moving from one landscape to another. But mostly they just sit around in their habitat. We don't have a lot of migratory animals in America where they've got large herds of things. It's easier to see. Here it's not so much migration, although we do have Ramsar. It's young animals dispersing to new habitat. So in the Koala Coast, for instance, we're building linkages of networks of stepping stones and nodes and other linkages to allow dispersing juveniles to find new habitat or to recolonise habitat that had previously been um, denuded of its fauna. So we talk about cores, we talk about nodes, we talk about networks, and we do talk about corridors and restoring corridors because we have a highly fragmented landscape. Now Don's going to talk about landscape fragmentation, but I will tell you we are highly fragmented. We're split into about 65 major core areas and over 250,000 other fragments that are less than 20 hectares in size. So Humpty Dumpty has been smashed. He's in bits all over the landscape. So how do we put those bits together? What is the most appropriate permeable landscape we can create to put those bits together? What tools do we need to put those bits together? What plans do we need to put those bits together? How do we mathematically identify which fair areas perhaps to buy to link the most fragments together? And there are tools to do all of these. And there's some simple rules that we all can do, which is if you find a fragment, seal its edge. It's the edge effects that really whack the habitat. It's the light interplay with ammonia and the weediness of the edge and the fire coming into those, um, to those forest fragments and then linking them to water and to their requirements. So it's not just linking habitat. You've got to find where the bioavailable water is and make sure there's safe landscapes to connect to that biological water. So you've got solid links and you've got stepping stones and nodes. You can't let people say, oh, that's isolated now. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's not going to survive. Well, if that's the attitude you have, of course it won't survive. But even a little patch this big has tremendous biodiversity. Because what we know now is that fungi run forests. So those spores and those invertebrates in those areas are actually what pattern the ecosystem. And recently they did some mapping in the US to find these large forest areas are run by three or four species of fungi that cover thousands of thousands of hectares. Linking root to root, mycelia to root, and on again, exchanging nutrients between trees mediated by funguses. So every little patch of forest has unique biodiversity and soil and upper story. So each and every little fragment is a little seed that can grow into a bigger thing. So we can't accept the self-fulfilling prophecy that a small fragment is doomed or that a fragmented population of, say, koalas, for instance, is doomed because they've been fragmented. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our job as habitat restorers and carers is to make sure that those predictions don't happen by application of community effort, community linkages, and better understanding of how to rebuild those landscapes. And I guess that's what we're all here today to learn about, is how to rebuild those landscapes. So that's the link between water, animals, plants, soils, all those things, and putting people back into that landscape so that we can actually manage that landscape. Because as I said before, this is a long-term project. We need to be dwellers on the land. We acknowledge the traditional owners, but the traditional owners had a theory that landscapes needed people. People are not an add-on to the ecosystem. They are an essential component. So we are that ingredient. It's up to us to become the new traditional managers of the land to carry out that activity of looking after, monitoring, caring and restoring those landscapes to protect the things we hold in value. So it's restoring that sense of connection that maybe our ancestors had in Europe, say, 10 or 15,000 years ago, or even 1,000 years ago. So we've got that intimate connection to landscape. A naturalist friend of mine who died recently, Strider up in the Northern Territory, has this theory that we're not actually fully mature individuals unless we have a connection to our landscapes. Mm. He had this theory that like all animals, and we are, we need a habitat. We need a home range. 
dare I say, we even need territory. And that allows us to be fuller, richer human beings. So we need to find our role in that landscape, a smart role to know what we're doing, how to restore it, where we're going, but also to pass that role on to future generations so that we have this sense of belonging and get a deeper meaning and fulfilment out of restoring landscapes. And we can do that through the years. Thank you. Collecting some of these fungi in our nurseries in the soil to sort of make sure they're present in the uh, it, It's always wise, and I've advised Wayne to do this, to collect a little bit of litter and stuff from the area and, and spread it around. It, it can't hurt, but you don't want to move from batch to batch. But really, if, you, if you're building on, if you're not just starting there, if you're starting at an edge, you should be able to get them anyway. If you're starting near a little patch, you should be able to get them anywhere. The difficulty is where you're starting away from somewhere. And there's nothing else around. There, well, you've got to find your nearest patch and maybe collect a little bit of leaf litter from there. But talk to the fungi people. They'll, they'll let you know. You'll just hear. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, are you aware, and this is a sunshine coast, that we've been trying to um, link some of those pristine pockets of rainforest, um, they're now just tiny yeah. um, parts, and I'm just wondering, is there a group up there or groups that are well, trying to do that? Yeah, there are. The, the NHC funded the Rainforest Recovery Program, which led to the listing of the semi evergreen vine thickets as an endangered ecological community by the federal government. So groups such as Noosa Land King would have been involved with that, groups further afield at King have been involved with that, groups in the Bernard Mary have been involved with that. I believe Sunshine Coast Regional Council has a program to look at that. Sunshine Coast Environment Group, if you want to go to a non-government organisation up there, would be able to put you in the link. Plus there's a Mullaney Bush Links project if you're up on the mountain there in the Blackwall Range. No, it, it's simply that yeah. last time I was up there, um, I saw some uh, just exquisite rainforest absolutely mm. raised um, mm. to, for a um, car park. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Mm. Well, look, on a good news front, that's still happening and we're still going backwards in terms of our native landscape. But on the good news front, since the 1980s, we've been able to reduce vegetation clearing by 75% in this region. Mm. And when, it, when under the last... State government, when clearing went up around Queensland, in South East Queensland it stayed flat. So the partnerships and linkages we've made between the community and government policies and VCAs and local laws and conservation zoning and incentive programs and VCAs and stuff has held the line in South East Queensland when it hasn't in other areas. We're still going backwards. But we've got it down to a level where it's on the, on the ropes, as it were, with a final push, we can probably start. Do that question. What's that? Oh, I'm actually going to just say on the fungi thing. Yeah. Just like, um, what's the, you know, when we vegetate, normally it's the trees that keep in the ground. Yeah. But no one really thinks about the mycorrhizal association underground and how that, yeah. you know, how the fungi, as you said, lead the way for everything mm. else and other, like, you know, the, um, the pioneers of yeah. plants. Is that something that one day Australia is going to start? Yeah, like other countries are. Oh, I, I think part of the reason we plant near edges is to get those effects, even though we don't know them all. And I don't think anyone's ever funded a comprehensive fungi survey yet, let alone a comprehensive biodiversity survey or a beetle survey or an anything survey. Um, we sort of go, well, you know, if we do that and we connect near the edge, we'll get all these free ecosystem services like that. I know in people who've done dune rehabilitation, they're very particular about making sure that they've got some soil samples in it because in the June situation it's the mycorrhizal fungi that make the moisture availability in the sandy ecosystems and that's facilitated by the casuarinas. So it's an undiscovered country. Uh, we'd love to know more and I'd love to have 100,000 bucks and go to the fungi and say, there you go, off you go. Hey, let's propagate some mycorrhizal fungi, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it, and then take it. Has the main road got a clue like, to extrapolate on the plan out the offspot of the bridging areas? No. I'd like to say yes. <laughs> but they've made a lot of roadside wetlands, so they understood that. But as you know, main roads was re-engineered under the last government, 
and they got rid of all the environmental people. And what happens is for each main road project, they put together a consortium of contractors and staff. Now, each project is separate from every other project. So unless staff go between one project and another... So in, in 2000, we had high hopes that it was spread across all main roads and this would be the way things are done? No. So we've got to rely on local groups to engage with main roads as they're building projects to really force them into best practice. Because it's not going to happen organically through a silo, here we say, concretised engineering landscape like main roads, unfortunately. Uh, Ted, and then um, I can't see your name next year. Uh, Mick, uh, could you just indicate with the loss of uh, some of our standard legislation, the advance, scientific advances that you've seen probably in the last five years on ecosystem services, groundwater dependent ecosystems and, and climate change? So I understand the last part of the question, Ted, but the first part, you want to say what's been lost out of all that? Oh, well, we know what happened in 2012 to 2015. Yeah. We lost... A whole lot of environmental staff across um, three levels of government. Well, okay, basically we've lost a lot of corporate memory, we've lost a lot of momentum on those issues. We were starting to drag government policy into looking at processes, not things, which you've alluded to, the groundwater and the ecosystem services and things like that. There's still a lot of community support for that, but governments can only undo damage at a tenth the rate we're done. And there's got to be will. And right now you have to say governments are not really enthusiastic on this topic. They're not out there being proactive on this topic. So if you have a local state member, a local member or a federal member, it's your job to go and see them and make sure these issues are in front of them. Because unless people are in their faces, they will forget about it. No politician ever got sacked really for doing nothing. Plenty have been sacked for being courageous. But they only respond if they see an issue in front of them. Otherwise, their default setting is to do nothing. The person next to that, what was your name? Yeah, hi. Um, Di Glenn, I'm from Sun. Yeah. Um, talking about the biological hotspot of South East Queensland, Tim Lowe identified Brisbane Forest Park as a really important corridor from Brisbane up to Mount Glorious, up to the Daniel Range. Are you aware that both the Inaugurate Reservoir and Uncuta is being fragmented? They're creating leases, they're privatising, and they're putting in commercial tourist attractions. And I don't think they've looked at heritage, and I don't think they've looked at ecology. Mm. Yeah, it, it's always the death of a thousand cuts, isn't it? And that, that's what, when we did a fragmentation analysis, what we found is they're not big fragments being chopped in half, although that happens. It's little fragments being peeled away from the edge or keyholes being created. So when we looked at the patterns of fragmentation, that was the patterns we saw. And again, the antidote is to make sure as many people, every letter for a politician is worth 100 votes. So the more letters you get to people, the more they'll have to pay attention. But the policies that allowed us to, to look at those corridors, which is the biodiversity planning assessments and things like that, we lost tools. And the government hasn't seen it as a priority to put them back. I think most people were in shock after that onslaught and, and really we haven't got ourselves together to really push those. But they, there's too much to do. But we need to do it. So those corridors are important. They are redoing the biodiversity planning assessment. That corridor has come up as of regional significance again. So that tool exists, so quote it and use it. The biodiversity planning assessment is currently under review by the Environment and Heritage Department and it will come up as far regionally significant that corridor. I have been stalking my ministers. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes. It's a follow-up from, from this topic. Yeah. I haven't kept up with it in recent years, but one of the big difficulties has always been the, the degree or the thoroughness of um, uh, cost benefit or the, the, the loss. Yeah. What is the cost of of uh, removing all these functions. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not convinced that I've seen any really, or heard of any really good uh, pushes to try and work at the, at, around this so that, that we start looking at this whole issue of time. 
Mm. And the way they, they calculate things, if you're going to put a bridge across the river, if you're going to do something like that else, what are the costs? What will it cost to actually stabilise having put something else in there if you want to retain it? If you don't, what have we lost? And what does it actually cost mm. to, to put something like that back in place? Mm. I mean, there's a, there's a whole lot of areas there that I think we, uh, we, we simply mute. Well, it's always a complex subject, but what you're broadly talking about is the value of ecosystem services and the way Costanza, Robert Costanza in the US did this in about 1997 and we managed to get it into the SEQ regional plan last time round that the region had to take into account the value of ecosystem services and the cost of replacement of those services if it's surrounded for infrastructure. Now, he worked on a cost of replacement table and he worked out the global value of ecosystem services with the order of a trillion dollars per annum. In South East Queensland, we did it recently, we worked out it's $13,000 per person per year is the value of ecosystem services we get. And if you start to subtract that, well, then it loses. But who, who, the problem economically is what's valued to one person is valued to others. So in Brisbane, we can say the cost of clearing and, and non-creek repair is the, what it costs to have to clean the drains out to rebuild all that hard infrastructure. The cost of fisheries is another thing. So we did a good run at it by getting in <coughs> ecosystem services as Ted brought out to the regional plan. It was a regional policy that all councils had to have regard to. But how many of them translated it to their plan? <coughs> how, so, many, how many case studies have been done and then pushed through to say this is the sort of uh, process we should be going with these sorts of elements? I mean, the whole time frame. Yeah. I'll do it over a 10 year time frame. So. Yeah. When we know it's going to take, it'll take more than double the time to actually <coughs> create those systems. Well, we did a case study for the entire region. We published about it in Ecology and Society. The US Geological Society call, Service called it the seminal study the rest of the world should look at in South East Queensland. We did a case study with the uh, Morton Bay Regional Council where they mapped all the ecosystem functions and services in the area. The problem comes with a little concept of fungibility and trying to put a dollar value on all that. We can qualify and say this amount of ecosystem services has been lost. But the value depends on who's receiving those services. And people will say they have a willingness to pay, but will they pay? And so politicians are loath to, to base that on. But you can look at the engineering. We can say at the Oxbow that the way we implemented by protecting ecosystem services made the road finish under budget and under time. So can we have more case studies? Can we get this thinking more into them? Yes, we can. It's in there in the regional plan now. They're reviewing the regional plan now. To keep it in there is a vital thing. So if you look at the documents for that, you can have your say on it and say, we need to look at this thinking. We need to look at how ecosystem services are being replaced when we lose the infrastructure. It's a complicated issue. I could go on for hours about it. Sorry, Bruce. Last question? Yeah, just a quick one. I was, I was just interested in, in these linkages and what we've just been talking about in how if you've done a lot of studies and there's a lot of information out there, has that been linked to the legal framework in any way to give it protection? Well, that's in the regional plan, yeah. which is under the Integrated Planning Act or the Sustainable Planning Act now. Yeah. It is formally constituted as a regional planning committee, which means it's a regional dimension under the State Planning Act. Okay. So that policy in the plan is law. Right. But like all laws, do they get implemented? They get interpreted. So council then has to interpret its planning scheme and say, how do we look after ecological systems or ecosystem services in our planning scheme? Mm -hmm. And who, who checks that they have? So what we found is you can put it in, like in the Vegetation Management Act, I said on the Ministerial Advisory Committee, we put in the ecological processes on which life depends mm -hmm. as an object of the Act. Mm -hmm. But how it worked out is they would just map vegetation based on their photo interpretation and the high conservation values which encompassed all the processes mm. never got implemented. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, put it in. Oh, no, they're not doing it. You know, we haven't got it again. Continuous. There are a trillion reasons why they're not going to do it. And all us as to why they are. Mm. The development industry doesn't like constraints. Mm. Infrastructure providers don't like constraints. I think you've proved that... Yeah. Uh, given those constraints, yeah. people will react to survive. Yeah. Therefore, you can build a highway across yeah. Yeah. A, a waterway. 
Um, so that only happened as a result of public yeah. pressure. It was no policy when we did the Oxford. There was no VJ, there was no offsets legislation, there was no climate change legislation. Yeah. Goodwill got us there yeah. when legislation didn't. Yeah. You've got to do it all. Mm. But it's, it's never easy. If it was easy, someone would have done it by now. Yeah. Believe me, we've tried. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yeah,